Hello, everyone. We continue our discussion. So one important aspect in terms of recruiting and everything, retaining staff is how to motivate the employees. So in motivating employees, we tend to focus on certain internal things or external things that may be able to influence the what and the how. So motivation is very important because it's shifting is a new trend and basically involves shifting trend in talent behavior and aligning strategies with people. Changing physical contract and building a successful employment relation. Engaging strategies and recognition strategies at an individual level. So to motivate an employee, ensures that the employee is able to put in the maximum best. How do we intend to motivate an employee? So in motivating an employee at the workplace, basically there are three things you must consider. The desire to do the job, that is the motivation. The ability to do the job, that is the ability. And the resource to do the job, that is the work environment. Now, in terms of our direction as to how to motivate an employee, a motivated employee is willing to exert a particular level of effort intensity for a certain amount of time. So an unmotivated employee is able to exert a particular form of intensity. The motivation here we are discussing refers to those forces within a person that affect his or her direction, intensity, and persistence. Now, these forces can basically be grouped under two. That is what you call the content approach or the process approach. Now, the content approach basically tries to determine those things that are actually motivating people to do the things. They are basically, the um, content approach are those things that are actually motivating people to do the things. That is, what are the things motivating people? And the process I put basically focus on the actual process or how the motivation goes on. So basically focus on how the motivation goes on. So according to the process theories, employees have a cognitive decision-making role in selecting their goals and means to achieving them. These approaches are therefore concerned with trying to establish how employee behavior is energized. Now under them, Content approach, we can basically talk about. Um, they're going to discuss some theories, and the theories of how they explain the content approach are basically we talk about the Abraham Maslow's hierarchies, we can talk about Clinton Adelphus, um, existence, um, ALG theory, we can talk about the Frederick Hexberg two factor model, and we can talk about David McClone's Lentinist model. Let's first of all start with Abraham Maslow's or the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So the hierarchy of needs, Abraham Maslow, he basically presented five main hierarchy of needs. And he believes that this hierarchy of needs, an individual tend to achieve the minimum level and tends to move from the minimum level to the highest level of needs. So the minimum level of needs is what you call this physiological needs at the highest form needs are what you call them um, the self-actualization needs so individual basically with the physiological needs wants to satisfy basic human conditions such as food drink sex and air so once these basic needs are satisfied every human being wants to satisfy these needs first and therefore move to identify or the next needs so he wants a good place to sleep, he wants a good salary, a good environment. Once the person is able to attain this, then the person thinks about safety and security needs. So the safety and security needs, which includes protecting from physical and emotional harm. Protecting from physical and emotional harm. The person is able to have, I mean, a desired environment where the person feels uh, uh, protected. Then when the person gets protected or feels or satisfied that need, the person moves to what you call the affiliation needs. So the affiliation needs where the person is able to have a sense of belonging. The sense of belonging intends the need for friendship, the love and affection and accepted by the peers. So when the person satisfies that need, the person aims to achieve what you call the self-esteem needs. The self-esteem needs when the positive the person has the need for a positive self-image and self-respect and the need for recognition from others. So the person have self-respect, 
aim for self-respect and image recognition for others. So this in an organization, this need can be satisfied by means of complement to employees, access information, job titles, and challenging job assignment. We can, a person in, can also move to the highest form under the hierarchy needs and in terms of motivating the person, that is the self-actualization needs. And here it's when the person realizing one's potential through growth and development. The person is on top of the hierarchy. So providing employees with development opportunities, challenging assignment and decision-making opportunities tends to motivate the person to attain this kind of uh, human development. So Abraham Maslow theory, what it's trying to say is that a person attempts to satisfy the more basic needs first and therefore progress to the higher needs. So in a company, if you're able to identify this, how this person's individual needs are, then the person can be able to progress in that sense. Another important um, theory is the ADFS ERG theory. The ERG here is um, the existence, the relatedness, and growth needs. So one important thing is that Ibrahim Maslow's theory being the basis, most of these other theories tend to focus on this theory and redefine it. So Abraham, um, our first theory basically represented three core needs, the resistance, relatedness, and the growth. So the existence needs, this needs relates to a person's basic material existence need. So here it refers to Abraham Maslow, psychological and safety needs. So the same needs that Abraham Maslow classified as the five main, here they classified it as the three main. So the person's um, physiological and the um, safety needs under Abraham Maslow is being classified here as the existence need. They need to relate to a person's basic material and existence need. And the person's relatedness. So relatedness here, the need for a person to be desired or the interpersonal person's relationship and interaction. So here basically refers to Abraham Maslow's social or affiliation needs social and affiliation needs, and the external aspect of a grammatical self-esteem needs, self-esteem needs. Now, under the growth needs, this relates to the desire for an individual to make a creative and a productive contribution. This refers to a grammatical esteem and self-actualization needs, esteem and self-actualization needs. We can also, and try to talk about the fact that while Abraham Maslow's story tends to believe that um, one person needs to attain one need level before can move to the other, this um, ERG theory tends to believe that um, an individual can attain um, or the, the individual needs being influenced, the behavior of this individual can be influenced simultaneously and not in a heretical form as Abraham Maslow presented. We can also talk about the Hesbeck two-factor theory needs. The Hesbeck two-factor theory needs. Now, the Hesbeck two-factor theory needs, which consists of what you call the maintenance and motivational factors. So, the maintenance factors, or also known as the hygiene, do not act as motivational factors. So, the maintenance factors do not act as motivational factors, but if they are absent in an organization. This could have a negative effect on the morale. So they are not a motivational factor, but they are needed because when they are absent, it can affect the morale of the individual. And this may maintenance factors or the aspect of the uh, company may include the organizational policy, the administration, the equipment, the supervision, the interpersonal relationship with police and supervisors, the salary status, the working conditions, and the work security. All these things may tend to have some influence, but may not necessarily be motivating factors of the individual, but they are working environment that are needed to also inspire. And the other uh, factor, which um, talks about it as the motivational factors, which is also called the group factors, basically focus on the content of the job. So these include aspects of achievements, successful completion of tasks, recognition for what has been achieved, the job itself, growth and progress, responsibility and feedback, motivation factors are benefits over and over the normal job. 
to be done, which tends to increase the employee satisfaction because employees get more out of their normal job. So this type of factors, these motivational factors to inspire or general growth factors also present a motivating factor to employees. They present a motivating factors to employees. Now, we can also, uh, uh, um, Hazen's um, factors tend to distinguish between what you call the internal motivation and external motivation. So this internal motivation originates from the satisfaction that occurs when a task is executed. And the external motivation usually acts, the, um, involves actions taken by a third person to influence um, somebody's or to motivate somebody. Now, the first three theories that we've discussed basically are related and we can group them. So later there will be a chart to show. But let me quickly go on to speak about the McClellan's theory of needs. Now, at the McClellan's theory of needs, basically focused on the primary incentive in, in, in incentive needs. And basically, this theory tends to uh, um, talk about three important needs the needs for achievement, the needs for power, and the needs for affiliation. So in terms of the needs for achievement, this is the need to excel, to be successful, or to um, exceed a set standard. And the need for power, this is the need to be influential, to control others, and to make others behave in a way they would need others. Um, um, in terms of the need for power, there's a need to be influential, to control others or to make others behave in a way they would not otherwise have they would have behaved. And there's the need for affiliation. With the need for affiliation, this is the need for a warm and a close interpersonal relationship to be liked or accepted by others. One interesting thing about this kind of thing is that with the kind of we tend to understand people from these three levels of need. It would tend to, if you want a particular position, you assess them on these three levels, you tend to focus on or which kind of attributes or qualities are needed. So research has found that employees with high need for power and low need for affiliation make good managers. So if somebody has a high need for power and low need for affiliation, you make good managers. So this needs tend to, then if you want somebody to be a manager, you have to assess this needs to explain the person's uh, position. Now, another thing too, as I said, that in terms of the first three models, the um, Maslow's, the Hesbeck, and the motivation and the maintenance two-factor model, the Hesbeck's two-factor model, Hesbeck two-factor model, and the Adams uh, um, situation, Adams model. So with the Maslow's model, um, we try to compare um, Hesbeck model with Maslow's model. And with that, realizes that um, there's some form of similarity. So Hesbeck recognition status, um, achievement status, work is self-responsibility, basically considers Maslow's needs and self-actualization. We also have the social network. And all of what this chart is trying to say is that the models actually tend to relate in some sense because what is being talked about here the same in this person's um, analysis. The factors that are motivating individuals and motivating individuals does the self-esteem and the self-actualization needs and the maintenance needs are basically the social safety and the security needs. So we also move on to talk about some of the concepts or some of the theories of what we call the content-based approach. The content-based approach will speak about the expectancy theory, the equity theory, the goal setting theory, and feedback. So before we move on to this content-based approach and the process-based approach, we can also feel and discuss some of the um, implications of the content-based approach. And with the um, content-based approach, Stories basically suggest the need for change. So one of the implications is that they suggest the need for change. The managers need to another um, implication is that managers need to balance power need with the um, affiliation need. Another implication is that needs may be unconscious. 
Some of the needs may be unconscious. Some of the needs may be unconscious. And another uh, um, application is that managers, um, these content-based approaches um, warn managers against replying, relying too much on financial rewards as a source of employee motivation. So these are some of the implication of the model that it wants management to go beyond financial motivation and are the other things that may motivate the employee. We have also talked about the fact that the needs may be unconscious. Needs of people that needs managers need to focus on may be unconscious. And also the need to balance certain aspects of the needs in terms of power need and with affiliation need. And we also the fact that um, suggest that the needs for change that different employees have different needs at different times. So that is one, um, these are four main implications of the content-based approach. Now we move on to the process-based um, um, approach. And as we said, with the process-based approach, we try to identify the process by which factors influence motivation, the process by which factors influence motivation. So we have I've already talked about the theming, Topics we are going to focus on our team in theories. So the expectancy theory, it was um, by Victor Rooms, expectancy theory. So motivation depends on two aspects: how much we want something and how likely we think we are get it. So the expectancy theory: how much do we want something and how likely do we think we are to get it? It basically settles on four main assumptions. And these assumptions include the behavior is a combination of forces. Behavior is a combination of forces controlled by individual and environment. People make decisions about their own behavior in an organization. Different people have different needs, goals, and certain desires. People will act in a certain way and tendency to act in a certain way. In it's about the expectancy theory that we need to focus on is the expectancy, the instrumentability, and the failures. So the expectancy here, the first expectancy, refers to a person's belief that a certain level of effort will lead to a particular level of performance. So here is the person's um, how performance or how person's effort influences um, performance expectancy. Performance expectancy. We can also talk about the instrumentability. Instrumentality. Instrumentality refers to the strength of a person's belief that a certain performance will lead to a specific outcome. So certain performance will lead to a specific outcome. Now the valence or what you call the disability refers to the attractiveness or on and anticipated satisfaction or the satisfaction that the individual feels towards the outcome. So how the individual feels towards the outcome. This is the expectancy theory. Now we can also quickly look at equity theory and organizational justice. So equity theory and organizational justice, this theory is based on the assumption that people are motivated by the desire to be treated equally. So the desire to be treated equally in the workplace. So the state of equity exists when one employee's input outcome ratio compared with other employee in a similar position is equal. So once the um, people are able to compare their effort and rewards with those of other in a similar position, they tend to be motivated in that sense. So the employee equity tension um, must um, experience this equity tension, and this can be experienced when the employee may change input, the employee may change output, the employee may change his or her attitude. The employee may change his or her, uh, um, may change the person with whom he or she compares himself with. And the employee may leave the job. That's when the employee feels that uh, 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 he has not been um, fairly treated, or in terms of when he compares himself with others and realizes that he may not be treated. These are the things that are likely to occur. When this occurs, um, the role of equity will result into what you call organizational justice. It will result into what you call organizational justice. So organizational justice reflects the extent to which employees perceive that they are being treated fairly at work. And this will take maybe three, uh, this will be discussed in three different components. 
distributive justice, the procedural justice, or the interactional justice, interrational justice. So the distributive justice here refers to the perceived fairness of how resources and rewards are distributed or allocated. Or procedural justice defined as the perceived fairness of the process and procedures, procedures used in making allocation decisions. With the interactional justice referring to the quality of the interpersonal treatment people receive when procedures are implemented, when procedures are implemented. So equity theory has many implications for management, including the following. Employees are powerful. Employees are powerfully motivated to correct the situation when their perception of fairness is offended. The theory also emphasized the need to pay attention to the perception of the employees, the perception of the employees matters. This theory also um, speaks about the fact that justice perceptions are influenced by the extent to which management explains the decision, its um, decisions, the importance of management communications and the rationale behind their decision. The employees should also participate in decision making. That is one other implication of these theories. The other implication of these theories, which I'll encourage you to also in terms of your readings. Now, let's quickly also look at the goal setting theory. Now, with goal setting theory, this theory tends to uh, uh, um, look at the fact that people tend to be motivated by once they set up a goal, they means to achieve that goal is a thing. It means that they get motivated. So the goal setting has a motivational value because those not only direct attention, but also regulate efforts, increase assistance, and foster the development and application of the task strategies and the action plan. And the task strategy and the action plan. One important thing about goal setting is the feedback. So providing feedback on employee, whether the goal that they set has been achieved is an important thing for employees to be motivated. The goals inform employees about their performance standards and expectations so they can channel their energies accordingly. So give feedback immediately. Evaluate. Evaluation should be descriptive. The focus should be on behavior and not on the personality. Feedback should be specific and not general. Feedback should be directed at a behavior and not um, uh, um, should be directed at behavior that can be changed. Um, development activities should be agreed upon. And with this um, um, feedback, it's about what you call them self-efficacy. So self-efficacy is also central to good, the goals and uh, setting term. It refers to the belief it refers to the belief in one's capacity to perform a specific task to reach a specific goal. So self-efficacy, how competent somebody is, it makes sure that somebody attains a specific goal. Now, we can also talk about the implication of this process based theory. Now, with the theories that we just discussed here, some of these implications may be intention, intention play a role motivated behavior. The intention is very important. And intention is whether the people are expected to be happy or not. Another um, implication is that the concept of feedback is critical importance. Feedback is of critical importance, which we have also discussed. Uh, Process-based theory all have a rational element. So all these theories talk about rational element with employees critically gathering and analyzing information. The theory also includes some form of self-assessment. So it includes some form of self-assessment. A non-rational component is also important in some of in some of the most recent approaches. The element may be values, culture, and feeling that arises from the self-efficacy belief. So these are all important strategies that we have discussed. We continue to look at employees' motivational strategies. So there are many various means of employer motivating employees. Some of these include the job design. And the job design here, we talk about rotation job, enlargement, job um, enrichment, because 
changing people's um, moving from, from one department to another, you tend to see oh, when a person works at this department, he tends to do well. When a person is job is enriched, that is when you allow the person to do more desirable or more challenging tasks. So all the job design tends to improve the uh, and motivate the employee. Another strategy is also to employ the employee involvement program, such as participative management and quality circle. So when the employee um, is involved in the participative process in terms of what right, that goes on in the company, in the organizational process, and the organizational process, there's some form of it encourage commitment among the employee. It encourages commitment among the employee. He has the success of self-belonging to the work and he says that his contribution is needed. We can also talk about the fact that uh, another strategy, the management by objective. So the management by objective is also basically close to what you call the goal setting uh, and theory, the goal setting theory. And here, so with this idea, with this um, strategy, set up goals and use goals as a way of measurement and to check whether people have um, performed or completed their tasks. So directly determine the feedback on the performance given. So once you set up a goal and you test to see whether people have attained or performed those tasks, um, it tends to motivate them, it gives an employee some form of motivation. We can also talk about the entrepreneurial incentives. So entrepreneurial incentives, that is when now new ideas from employees are being developed in their organization. So now employees are being involved, the ideas are needed and they come up with new ideas, suggestions and ideas that are important to the business. And that is um, some form of uh, motivational strategy. We can also motivate people through training and education by constantly training your workforce or education on new uh, strategies, even sometimes you make them go to school or Better education in certain aspects to give them some form of motivation. Employee recognition programs. So, employee recognition programs, in terms of um, when maybe there's a more profit in terms of the company has performed, the employee has performed beyond average and the company has more profit. It has to give certain, um, increase certain um, job recognition or profit sharing or profits or other certificates just to motivate them. Um, empowerment programs. So empowerment programs too, um, you are, we are saying here that this method of enhancing employee motivation so through empowerment is the process of enabling employees to set, set their own goals, make decisions and solve problems within their sphere of responsibility and authority. So we empower them to be able to have their own goals and work towards them. And a reward system, a reward system. So a reward is directly related to the expected Expectancy theory. Expectancy theory. So a person believes that once he puts in certain effort, then there's going to be a certain reward for the person at the end. So with that, the person is being uh, motivated. And you can also talk about career management. So career management and development is the part that an employee identifies and follows in order to achieve his or her aspirations. So if somebody wants to be a professor, then you must know that you have to be in academia. You must know and you tend to take a career path and you are motivated in that sense to do more publishing works and to work in that specific uh, specified field in order to attain that level that you need. In order to attain that level that you need. An important aspect in terms of human resource is that there is legal or there's some form of laws uh, um, in the environment in terms of guys and um, human resource activity in terms of labor uh, uh, rights in terms of labor laws and once we are discussing the concept of human resource we cannot ignore so the constitution of south africa um, act number 28 constitution have also laid out certain um, requirements and certain laws that need to be followed in terms of human resource so most important piece of legislation and sets out the structure of the state, the bill rights to the 12, to the 23 relates specifically to the labor rights. Now, it's not just this law, there are other laws maybe we will also look at, I'm just going to keep them for them. Maybe um, I also engage the class on this one also to read more. And in terms of the labor and 
the laws in terms of the laws affecting businesses, laws to regulate the form and functions of businesses, the Companies Act, the Labor Relations Act, the Business Conditions Act, the Employment Equity Act. All of these are uh, laws under the legislation, and basically here we are focusing mainly on South Africa. So there's a lot of um, businesses, or there's a lot of laws, because in terms of recruiting somebody, there are certain laws that are need to be given to protect the company, to protect the human the people, the workers, and as well as the, the regulation in terms of the business environment. So with the company, it's not just about the, the individual, but um, there are three forms of uh, people that come on board. That is what we call the apartheid. Now, the legislation is effort to regulate the fundamental human rights, the, the trade unions, and then the employees. So we have the government, we have the government, the state government, basically responsible for the secondary the regulating and the legislation. Then we have the two main people, that is the, the workers and the, the, the employees. So these three have come together to form what we call the trap and then they work in tandem. So we have the employees. We have laws that protect employees. We have laws that protect the workers, especially the workers' rights against discrimination and other laws. And we have the secondary participants. Now, some of the um, content of the, um, the Labor Relations Act, including the Freedom of Associations, the organizational rights to so the freedom of associations where um, workers or employees can join or form any trade union in terms of um, organizational rights where um, trade unions can approach any company and then try to um, engage their employees to join their union in terms of the bargaining and strategy uh, councils in terms of the commission of the council mediation and arbitration you can also talk about the labor court and the labor appeal court, the strike and the um, lockout. All of these are some of the uh, 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 spelled out regulations under the Labor Regulations Act, under the Labor Regulations Act. So you can also talk about communication. Communication is an important aspect in terms of this labor environment or the labor laws, grievances and disciplinary acts. Grievances procedure and employee responsible to real and perceived an alleged breach of the terms of the employment contract, the disciplinary act when employee falters, where the, um, the procedures that employees are supposed to go to to make sure that they, they realize or make sure that the, the, the right form of mindset is given to them. Now, they can also now talk about some of the basic uh, laws of. Other, other aspects in terms of the act. We have the basic conditions of employment act, the act number 75 for the 1975. The overall purpose of this act is to advance economic development and social justice in South Africa. So it gives effect to it gives effect to regulate the right of fair labor practices in the job field. We can also talk about the Employment Equity Act and the Employment Equity Act here is main to do away with all forms of discrimination in employment in South Africa, promoting equity and non-discrimination in the employment sector. So here, the Employment Equity Act is supposed to remove all forms of discrimination, discrimination in terms of gender, in terms of race or any form. Okay, so this is what this act basically is for. I also talk about the Skills Development Act. So the Skills Development Act basically aims at the resource planning to increase the level of investment and education in training in the labor market. We can also talk about the Skills Development Labor Act. The purpose of this act is to provide for the imposition of a skills development level. Now, we can also talk about the National Qualification Framework Act. Act number 67 of 2008. The objective of this act is to create an integrated national framework of learning achievement and to contribute to the full development of learners and to enhance the quality of education and training. And to enhance the quality of 
training. So in terms of the quality and training, we can talk about um, the types of qualifications. Uh, uh, in terms of this qualification, for example, uh, and we can talk about the SACWA, you know, the South African Standard uh, um, Review of Academic Qualification. So if you are somebody who is coming to South Africa, you must make sure you get the SACWA to make sure that you standardize your qualification to the South African system. So we have the general certificates, the school certificate up to the Victoria degree level. So that is what this legislation tends to look at. We can also talk about the Professional Health and Safety Act. The main purpose of this act is to protect employees by ensuring a healthy and a safe work environment. So when uh, there's uh, some threats to the environment or some threat to uh, and, uh, a person working, and this is what the purpose of this act does, is to ensure that people get the, the best. And then we have the compensation for occupational injuries and disease act. So if you're working in a specific field and there's some form of injury, this act tends to be the place to look out for how to get protected. So the act is basically compensation will be paid to an employee in an injury has been caused by an accident arising out of or in course of the employee's employment in a particular company. So once you get hurt in a company, this is the act that basically is to uh, act. And we can also talk about the Unemployment Insurance Act. So this act provides for the payment of benefits for a limited period to people who are ready and willing to work but are unable to work for whatever reason. So people who are unemployed are basically entitled to certain uh, uh, benefits and those benefits, that is what uh, this act also spell. We can also uh, talk about the Employment Service Act. The Employment Service Act, all of these acts are all under the labor legislation. So the Employment Service Act basically aims to repair all employment service provision contained in the Skills Development Act and to provide for a range of measures to promote employment and also regulate the employment of foreigners, regulate the employment of foreigners. Lastly, is to talk about the, the Protection of Personal Information Act. So the Protection of Personal Information Act this gives effect to the constitutional right to privacy by safeguarding personal information. And says by a responsible party and subjected to justifiable limitation. So this act, for example, in terms of our information that are with um, certain companies, certain uh, uh, um, data or certain um, uh, communication networks, we have certain rights that we get uh, we, um, uh, clients so that certain personal information are not processed or so maybe we are giving certain notice or not. So basically, all of this legislation have specific key characteristics. And I will encourage you all to read and, um, on all of these acts and get yourself familiarized with them. As you already, most of you are already in the job field, or as you prepare, it, go to the job field and get to know um, uh, uh, your right, your responsibility as an employee, as a uh, as, as a work as an employer, and also whether you are in the state government, what you also need to do. So when you are part of government, the regulations are basically needed in terms of the human resource space. So in terms of our discussion today, what have we discussed? We've discussed basically the human resource concept. We've discussed recruiting. We've discussed how to select and, and talent, how to plan, how to um, job analysis. We've also talked about how to motivate the people. We've talked about the legal environment in terms of the legislations. And we also tend to look at the various laws under the Labor Regulation Act, and I've encouraged you guys to do further readings on this section. It's been a long lecture, and I will end this lecture here. Thank you, and we'll have further discussion.